And now moving along on our session, Dr. Satera Lavasani will be speaking to us on the applications of cone beam for dental implants, what to look for and how to interpret the findings. Dr. Lavasani has a specialty certificate in oral and maxillofacial surgery, radiology and a master's in, sorry, I almost gave you an extra degree right there, <laughs> and a master's in dental diagnostic sciences from the University of Texas Health Science Center. She's a board certified oral and maxillofacial radiologist, a co-author of multiple textbooks, including the first interactive digital oral radiology textbook and the fundamentals of oral radiology and currently the, the assistant professor and director of oral radiology and advanced imaging at Western University of Health Sciences, College of Dental Medicine in Pomona, California. Please welcome Dr. Satera Lavasani with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here and speaking to the GDIA uh, attendees. Uh, let's get our lecture started. We already have uh, 10 minutes delay, so I'll try to, uh, I don't want to go faster, but I'll try to catch up our time. So um, today, the topics that we're going to talk about are basically um, how to interpret some of the basic and some of the important patterns of radiographic malignancy benign lesions and cystic and neoplastic. So look, when you want to think about, uh, let's say, uh, different diseases, I want to know, do you have a picture of them? Like, let's say we all agree that we have um, the malignant lesions have a presentation in maxillofacial region, right? We all agree on that. They can come in our panels and PAs. But I want to uh, see how good we are at interpreting those, how well we know the presentation. If we see them, are we able to uh, basically report them. The other thing we want to talk about are now we are going to 3D and we're going to use CBCT in our practices and we are, mo many of us actually, we want to know what are the anatomical structures that show in our CBCTs and what, what is their significance, especially related to implant planning and implant placement. The other thing we will go through is a little bit about uh, maxillary sinus pathologies. What are the signs, what are the symptoms, how to look for them and how to interpret them again. And then at the end we're going to talk about CBCT limitations. And CBCT is so amazing and so awesome, but what are the things that CBCT cannot show and what are the limitations? And then we touch on selection criteria. So now that we have 3D, shall we throw out our uh, 2D and panoramics? So let's get going. So before, <coughs> sorry. So before we get started, let's take a look at these two images. Can you guess what is the image on the left side? Definitely not a torture scene. That is when they used to take pano that way. That's when the pano source was intraoral. And if you look at the image on the left side, on the right side, you'll see that we have made significant progress. So now we can take cone beam CTs, see the structures with no superimposition. We can have clear vision of our sinuses, TMJ, airway, and everything. But so we have a lot of information. We have a lot of data, way more than when we had only 2D. The question now is, now that we see more, are we able to know more, or are we knowing more? Are we able to get more data out of it? So let's take a look together. So let's look at, take a look at this panoramic image together. I don't know if the light is good for you, or shall they dim the lights? Good? OK, perfect. So you guys take a quick look at this panoramic image. Do you see any problem? or? patient came, actually let me give you a little bit of history on this patient. She was a 50 year old patient, she was a 10 year uh, cancer survivor and she has had bisphosphonates before, oral bisphosphonates and she wanted to basically get those two teeth in the mm, quadrant, in the right quadrant replaced. So we got this panoramic from her. Do you see anything that raises a suspicion or let's take a PA? Let's take a PA, right? Thank you. So what do you think here we are seeing? How would you describe this phenomenon that we're seeing? Do we all see a radiolucency associated with anterior teeth, right? Like 26, 20, 27? <clears throat> Sorry. So, so when I saw this uh, patient in our clinic, I was like, you know, this really doesn't look right. Because what? Because I'm a radiologist and I have the training. So what did I see? The thing that I saw was basically the area of people 
irregular areas of PDL widening you see here, and that's exactly a textbook appearance of uh, what we call it uh, a malignancy look. So that's a malignant pattern. So it's so important that you establish those patterns in your mind. So whenever you see something like this, you can interpret it so that you'll be like, okay, I correlate this with that. And that's how I work every day. I can't memorize all the lesions, so I have to look at the lesions and see what patterns are they uh, looking alike. So we took a cone beam CT of this patient because we wanted, to what's, we wanted to know what's happening in the buccal and lingual cortical plates. So as you can see here on the axial view, we see a lot of destruction. Basically, all the air, anterior area has kind of uh, interruption of all the cortical areas of uh, mandibular area. Also, you can see there, there is kind of a permeative changes. The areas that, you know, uh, mutt eaten appearance, so this is called a mutt-eaten appearance of bone loss. That's what you see even in the cross-sectional view. So you see interruption of the cortex with no expansion. Whenever you see interruption with no expansion, it means that the lesion is so aggressive that doesn't give the bone the chance to expand. Because some lesions, let's say like amyloblastoma, it's locally destructive, but it's not malignant. So it's slow growing. It gives the bone the chance to expand. And then, of course, when the bone expands a lot, it's going to perforate. So that kind of comes with it. But whenever you see a lesion that's causing interruption of cortical, cortical outlines, let's say floor of the sinus, let's say something that's cortical, which is so dense, and you see that it's gone, uh, always think about something that needs further evaluation. So the reality of this case was that if you didn't know the pattern, you wouldn't be able to pick it up. So that's basically a nice thing to know. So this is the 3D volume rendering of the case, and then we sent it to our oral surgery, and then we had a biopsy, and the result came back as metastatic breast carcinoma. So her, basically her cancer had returned and, and attacked the area of her anterior mandible. So basically that wasn't a very um, good outcome, but it's so important to um, <clears throat> basically think about those uh, patterns. So so let's take a look at another, another panoramic together. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. This is a panel, you take it at your office. What do we think about this? What do we think about? Anywhere, yes, anywhere that looks somewhat abnormal. Upper left, right? Yes, we all agree that upper left look a little bit uh, different. So what is the difference here? What do we have and what do we not have? So let's see here. So basically, this is the man maxillary tuberosity here, right? So on that side, maxillary tuberosity is gone. This one is the floor of maxillary sinus. In that side, that is also gone. Interdental bone is also gone. So this tells me that there is a process that's happening that uh, basically eating the bone and it's causing the bone uh, to show no reaction whatsoever and just waste away. And that's the appearance of floating tooth. And floating tooth has been basically linked to uh, malignant lesions, from something like gingival carcinoma that just infiltrates to the bone and eats everything. So whenever, remember we talked about cortex, so whenever you see the cortex that's gone, floor of the sinus, always think about things that are a little bit more uh, advanced. So let's go and Take a look at this one. This one was a really interesting case. So this was a patient, this is a cropped panoramic of a patient in 2014. And this was another one uh, that we took in 2015. And this is the area in April 2015. At this date, the patient was reporting to have a little bit of uh, paresthesia and some kind of numbness in the area of eight, number 18 and area of her left, uh, basically, mandible. So what do you think? What are you seeing? Are we seeing anything, anything special comes to your eyes? What do we see? What has changed? Something has changed, right? So, so basically what has changed in, is this area that you can see we have a lot of permeative changes and a lot of bone that has been gone and wasted away with no, uh, let's say, no uh, response from the bone. You know, when things are slow growing, when pathologies are slow growing, let's say like a cyst, you see how a cyst has a very nice corticated border? What is that corticated border tell me? 
that tells me that the lesion is so slow growing that is giving the bone the chance to produce a sclerotic material to wall off the lesion. But here, bone has no chance because the lesion is so fast. It just has a very high mitotic rate. So this is uh, one of the representation of a lesion that's uh, basically not a good lesion and it's uh, a moth eaten appearance. So this lesion actually was intraosseous. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and the patient had to have a large resection of his jaw. So you can see the significance of just a small thing. You know, we, before I go to radiology residency, like 11 years ago, I used to think like malignancy has a scary look. You know, like they will talk to you, or you will like, when you say malignant, the panel is going to look something so sophisticated. No. Malignancy is actually very subtle, so you have to be able to pick up those um, basically patterns, radiographic patterns, and um, really what I feel now that I'm in education and academia, I see that we really didn't get much of this interpretation thing that they talk about. We all, what I got from in, radio, in dental school, most of us was panel, too far forward, too far backwards, chin up, chin down, interproximal spaces. So then uh, interpretation wasn't such a big thing. So, But now that we have the 3D and we see so much, we have so much more data, it's so important to uh, really educate ourselves. So the last case of our interpretation section of our lecture, I want you to take a look at this. This was a case we had actually at, in Texas when I was doing my residency. And the patient wanted to have an implant in the upper and lower jaws. So we took a comb beam and this is what we saw. So what do we think here? Do we see anything abnormal? Not necessarily, not because we're showing malignancy, everything is malignant. So, so let's give a chance to other people in the audience also to think about it a little bit. So basically what we see here, as, him, as uh, you pointed out, is that look in the airway. Look at this soft tissue that's kind of hanging down. And also look at this area in the airway that's kind of is being obliterated. Look at the hyoid bone. Where is this part of hyoid bone? Basically this area is gone. So um, let me ask a question. How many of you in the audience use CBCT on a regular basis in your practice? Or implant planning, anything? How many? So pretty good number of us, right? So basically, we are kind of technology savvy. So that's a good thing. So my question to you is evaluation of CBCT. You take the CBCTs. So who is responsible in your offices to interpret those images? Not to miss what we talked about. So that's an important thing to talk about. And it's my responsibility as a radiologist to tell you that you are responsible. And I just don't say it because that's my opinion. The reason I'm telling you is that there has been many publications that are saying that, and the, one of the most important ones that was published in Quad O, uh, basically uh, in 2008, is that uh, there are practitioner responsibilities. So when you take a combing city, there are responsibilities that comes with it. So, you know, when you go and you want to buy a comb beam, uh, usually the salespeople are like, yeah, buy this comb beam, we have a two-day course. You'll know everything. You can become perfect at interpreting comb beam, doing everything, and you, you're good to go. The reality is no. I went three years of training, and still I find things that I find them questionable. So you have to have the right training, or send your cases to a radiologist. Why? The reason is that if something, God forbid, about to happen, dentists that use CBCT should have the same standards, and they will be, if something you miss, you're going to be held accountable to the same level of a board-certified oral radiologist. And I think that's a very bad disadvantage, right? Like, you use it, and nobody looked at it, and then you get sued. That's a very, very sad um, kind of thing if it happens. And also, just as a pathology report needs a, with, that needs to come with a biopsy, an imaging report must come with a CBCT. So if they call me and ask me as a witness, expert witness, they are like, Dr. Lavasani, this is the case, this is it. First thing I'm going to ask is, where is the report? Does the 
case have a CBCT or not. So it's really important to have that in your mind, that uh, a radiology report. And first thing, you know, the theme of this uh, GDIA conference is how to prevent complications. I do think that there are two types of complications. One complications for the patient and one complications for us, for practitioners. How do we get out of trouble? So we don't want to take a city and get into trouble. So let's get moving on and uh, basically talk about implant-related complications. So if we divide implant-related complications into three categories, we can see that some of them are anatomically related. You know, so some of them is like you had nerve injury, there's bleeding, there's like sinus perforation, and some of them are because we didn't have proper planning. The implants are so close to each other, the angulation is wrong, and then we have procedural related. Some of them are lack of stability, lack of mechanical complications, and whatnot. So now the question is, what is the role of imaging? How can imaging help us? So basically, we would uh, be able to help in anatomical related problems, in treatment plan related problems, and some of the predictors of uh, primary stability and whatnot. So we're going to talk about that. So let's look at uh, cross-sectional imaging. So it's really nice that some people um, think that uh, CBCT is a new thing that came, but the reality is that cross-sectional imaging, which CBCT is a part of cross-sectional imaging, has been there for a long time, and we've been trying to see the third dimension for a long time with introduction of linear tomography and then with having the medical CT, we've been always trying to uh, basically have a cross-sectional information. So as the time went by, computers got more sophisticated, we were able to have better resolution and lower doses. So it's not a new concept. What is a new recommendation is that the recommendation, let's say in year 2000, was that you have to have a a AOMR, which is Academy of Oral Radiology, recommends that you have some type of recommends you have some type of cross-sectional imaging. And that time the recommendation was linear tomography. Now the time has changed. So in 2012, this is the latest recommendation that we have that we are being basically advised to use CBCT. So they are both part of a three basically cross-sectional imaging. Now with improved um, basically technology, we have better, uh, better tools to use. And also something to point out is that uh, one of the basically main people that had a hand in writing this article was Dr. Scott Gans. And today we are so honored to have him in this convention. I've learned so much from his articles and uh, I wanted to look at the references and even 10, 10 of the references was there his article. So I really feel blessed to be even speaking in the same venue that he is. So. Uh, let's talk about anatomy. So you take a combin CT, what are the important anatomical areas that you have to take, take a look at and consider? So first thing is that you want to know what is the shape, height, and width of your residual alveolar ridge, right? So we all know that when we lose our teeth due to bone remodeling, we start to lose our bone volume, height, width, and so on. So basically, that's how in cross-sectional imaging we can see the reduction of our uh, height and the width of our bone. So as you can see here, the sinus basically comes down, pneumatizes, it's called pneumatization. And I get a lot of uh, consults on this that what the people think um, sometimes that it's kind of a cyst or something, but this is just a 2D presentation of pneumatized sinus. When, when we lose one tooth, maxillary sinus is filled with air, so it wants to expand. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go down. So two things work against us. First is remodeling of crystal bone, so we lose crystal bone, and also the sinus wants to come down. So that's how we are kind of, we have two enemies in that sense. So we also want to know the residual ridge orientation. So as you can see in the area of right maxilla, we want to see what is the orientation. From a panoramic image, it's very hard or impossible to know what's the orientation so that you can plan your implant to be, to have a, uh, let's say, a very nice and parallel emergence profile so that you can be uh, successful. So that's kind of how we can take a look at that. So can you tell me what happened here? What was the problem here? Wrong orientation, right? Okay, so what happened here? 
wrong size, right? So not having that information kind of can really work against us. And also from cross-sectional information, we can have uh, some information about buccal plate presence, absence, and uh, so on. But one thing I have to remind you is that because implants are very dense, especially titanium implants, there is an um, artifact associated with them that's called beam hardening. So beam hardening sometimes really uh, reduces our chances of seeing the area just adjacent to the implant. So sometimes it's not the best modality to see the thin lines of bone that are there. So um, one of the methods to uh, basically increase that is to, if you have other metals, don't take those into your scan. So smaller field of view can help you. Also, you can, and I just learned that from Dr. Gans, that you can have a cotton pallet and co cotton roll and put it here and separate the lip so that you may be having a better, uh, basically, visualization. So those, bo both of those can help you somewhat. But the reality is um, it's always working against us. So um, let's look at some sinus pneumatizations that need a sinus lift. So we also use comb beam for that, right? So look at here, we don't have enough sinus bone height. We want to do a sinus lift. And also after we do the sinus lift, we want to evaluate our lift, how much bone we have right now. So you can make a measurement and see how much bone is available. So also for evaluation of post-op uh, sinus lift cases. Sometimes we have uh, basically buccal or lingual, mostly buccal bone deficiencies when we lose our teeth. So as you can see here at the area of three and five, we want to put an implant. On the um, axial view, basically your um, buccal plate has to look like that, but you can see two distinct dips that are going down. That's the area of number five, and then that's the area of number three. So that's also something that we can look for and really consider, because that can really help us to choose the size of our implant and also the need for block graft, bone chips graft, or whatever different types of graft that they want to talk about and really educate our patient to choose what they need. So one of the other things is evaluation of buccal deficiencies in the aesthetic zone. We know that when we are uh, planning implants, when we lose our teeth in the anterior area, there is a, a lot of bone loss, especially in the buccal area. So that's kind of uh, where we can evaluate that. And you see how thin the buccal plate is. So you can see that you can really add some volume by putting bone in the, buc in the buccal area. So those are all uh, examples of how we can evaluate our cone beam CTs and different anatomical structures. We can also have uh, evaluation of post graft. So we, let's say we, do a, we have a deficiency, we have a graft, block graft put in, and then uh, we can evaluate is the graft, uh, but they say, has it taken? So has it like integrated? There is any bone integration. So as you can see here, we see it on axial view that there is bone integration here, but some at this area, it's not. So possibly this is an um, area that we took from here. So maybe this needs more time to get grafted. So the next thing we want to talk about is nasopalatin duct. So nasopalatin structures is we have a foramina, nasopalatin foramen. Usually it's within, uh, let's say, three to six millimeters is a normal size. But if you see it more than six millimeters, you have to kind of uh, do a radiographic follow-up to make sure that it's not becoming a nasopalatin duct cyst. So those are basically examples of an enlarged nasopalatin duct. And as you can see, uh, here we have uh, 3D volume rendering, and you can see the air amount of, let's say, bone destruction that it has caused. Another example would be uh, another variation uh, that looks like a Mickey Mouse. <laughs> so uh, they can have like three, three uh, openings or four openings or different, different variations. But really, that doesn't um, change our pyramid line, just not to, uh, let's say, get um, close to it or um, basically perforate it. So, Next topic we want to talk about is um, evaluation of maxillary sinus. So what pathologies can maxillary sinus have? Like you see your maxillary sinus for your maxillary implants all the time. So how do we evaluate the uh, basically the um, things that are going on in our maxillary sinus? So we're going to talk about what is the normal anatomy in any interpretation, course, case, or whatnot. First thing we have to know is what is normal? 
How does normal look like? So that we have like a few normal cases in our mind, like in our library, so that whenever we look at things, we're able to know, is this normal or is it within normal limits? The more cases you see, the more your library of within normal limits is gonna expand. So also we'll talk about a little bit about odontogenic and non-odontogenic, uh, basically pathologies that you have in your, we uh, have in our sinuses. So let's talk about this one. So what are the things we have to consider when we are looking at a sinus? The first and most important thing we have to think about is the area that's called the oseomiatal complex. Basically, that's the area that our sinus will drain to. So all of the mucus that is in the sinus, our ciliary cells are gonna like move in a way that they want to let everything go here, which is here, and drain it to the middle meatus. So if for any reason, and that's how it's gonna look like in Columbia City on coronal view, if for any reason that area is blocked, also metal complex, we have a problem, and that's called sinusitis. Sinusitis and opacification of osomiatal complex and can have different reasons. So let's take a look at a few reasons and uh, see what's going on. So let's take a look at this panoramic for a second. What do you think about this one? Is the lesion in the sinus or did it come to the sinus? And also compare it with this one. They are both opacifications, right? Opacifications in the maxillary sinus. So, I give you this hint. Now take another look. So what do you think about the one that's the panoramic? Do we all agree that the radio opacity in the panel is above the floor of the maxillary sinus? Yes, yes. So it tells me that that radio opacity is in the sinus. Nothing went into the sinus. However, when you look at that one, you see that the floor of the sinus has been pushed up. So it went into the sinus. So always to know if the etiology of your pathology is odontogenic or non-odontogenic, think about, look at the floor of the maxillary sinus. Has it been pushed, displaced superiorly or no? That whatever is happening is within the boundaries of the maxillary sinus. For example, now, now that we talked about it, we know that this is a simple uh, mucus retention zoodocyst, which means like it's a very benign condition that's uh, kind of like accumulation of uh, mucus in the sinus, doesn't need treatment, doesn't need anything, and uh, so forth. So it's really important to know the origin. The thing, to <clears throat> the thing to know is that many pathologies that are in the sinus, I think almost about 68%, was I read it in an article, they are mostly odontogenic. So let's take a look at one of the cases that we have here. This was one of my actually students at Western University. She was 30 years old and she was complaining of really right side, uh, basically, uh, pain and pressure and post nasal drip. And she was like, Dr. I feel so bad in the morning, at night, and everything. So, and I have a PA. Would you take a look at it? So, let's look at, take a look at her PA together. What would you think when you look at this PA? What do we see? Uh, sorry? Sinus border, yes. But you know, do you also see on the mesial root of number three, there is elevation of the floor of maxillary sinus and a periapical radiolucency? Yes, we all see that, right? But number two is endodontically treated. In 2D, I don't see any problems, but like maybe a small radiolucency here, small, small, but I really can't see more, and I can't say more. And if I can't see something, I don't say something. So let's take a combined CT, which is the modality of choice to evaluate pathologies in the maxillary sinus. So this was the sagittal view that I cropped it here for you, which tells us a different story. What is the story? The story is that mesial root has a problem, periapical radiolucency. Distal root also has a periapical radiolucency that is causing interruption of the floor of maxillary sinus. And what does it do? 
it's pushing infection into the right sinus. So basically, we have a factory of pus and factory of infection that's kind of pushing everything to the maxillary sinus. And look at the large lesion that's associated with number two. So that's also something that we didn't see because of the superimposition of all the uh, structures that we have. So let's look at her sinus. Wow. Look at her sinus is so full. And remember we talked about osomietal complex. So her osomietal complex is full. So she has sinusitis. So this sinusitis has an odontogenic origin. So this is what we mean by having a uh, sinusitis with odontogenic origin. So here she took a lot of antibiotics. So the, basically the osomietal complex uh, opened up. But what you see is that she still has some amount of infection. And the reason for that is that she didn't do the endo yet. So they, they, those let her uh, f basically finish, um, like reduce her amount of infection, but uh, it's not over yet until she does the endo. So this one is really a very, so let's take a look at this one. What do you think? Now that we have some knowledge about sinus pathologies, you think this entity is within the sinus or came to the sinus? In the sinus, yes, yeah? perfect. So this is called uh, a mucus retention zoodocyst. Basically, it's, it's a benign condition. It doesn't need treatment. It's just a um, collection of mucus within the maxillary sinus. It can be in the, mostly it's in the floor of the sinus. Sometimes it can be in the walls, but mostly in the floor. So this one is a small one and doesn't need treatment, doesn't need anything. When you have a large uh, mucus retention zoodocyst, the potential complication for that is that when you want to do a sinus lift, you lift, the sin you lift this and then you lift the amount of uh, your mucus retention zoodocyst and you close the osseomietal complex. Do you remember? This is the $1 million area. So when you close this, patient will start having sinusitis problems. So that's really exactly the area that you have to make sure. And sometimes you can go with, a, with a kind of a syringe when you do doing your sinus lift and bring uh, and basically extract the kind of a yellowish fluid that comes out from uh, the sinus area to b basically shrink that. Sometimes sinus opacifications are due to uh, basically foreign bodies. Sometimes our implants go in and cause uh, basically reaction of the sinus. Sinus is not happy, mucosal thickening, mucosal reactions. Now you see that there is a sinusitis because of this implant, but believe it or not, I've seen cases that two, three implants are in the sinus and sinus hasn't reacted. So it's not a definite thing. If you see an implant in the sinus, it's going to cause sinusitis and it's going to fail. So that's also something to uh, consider. So what do you think about this sinus? What's happening here? A guy that drank so much champagne. <laughs> we all agree that these guys look like bubbles, right? So basically, uh, this is an appearance that's called persistence of air bubbles, and they are associated with acute sinusitis. When we have acute bacterial sinusitis, those bacteria will produce some air. So those air bubbles are the, basically what's being produced by uh, our bacteria in the sinus. Sometimes also acute sinusitis uh, has a lot of uh, water in it. So that's called air fluid level. So you know when you put water in a, uh, in a glass, you have like this kind of uh, concave appearance. So it's like you put a water in your sinus. So that's kind of uh, how your air uh, fluid level is going to look like. Tell me what you see in the walls of the maxillary sinus medial and lateral. Nothing has changed, right? Because it's in acute stage. Bone has not had the time to react or do anything. But sometimes our acute sinusitis become chronic, become chronic condition. So how will our sinuses look then? I put a normal sinus here, and this is a mucus retention zoodocyst that we said doesn't do anything. And then you have a chronic sinusitis. Just compare both of them so that you'll always remember. What is the difference? You can tell me. Ca dystrophic calcifications, yes. And what else? Look at the walls. Compare them. Thickening, yes, exactly. So thickening of the valves is because, again, you remember one of our defensive mechanisms is to produce a sclerotic material to wall off whatever lesion, cystic, 
malignancy, anything. So when there's infection, sinus will start to produce sclerotic material in its walls. So when you're on your axial view evaluating and you see opacification and you're like, oh my God, why the walls of the sinus are so thick and ragged? That's one of the reasons that the patient has uh, basically chronic sinusitis. And then, then you can see uh, kind of the dystrophic calcification that we saw here on axial view. So let's move on to our uh, next sinus problem. So th those sinus problems that we saw were, I mean, they're not good, they're infection and whatnot, but they are not malignant. So we always have to know what we don't know. So take a look at this panoramic image here, and also take a look at this, uh, basically this coronal image. In this one, you see that many of the teeth in the right side are gone. Floor of the maxillary sinus is also gone, and you see a soft tissue hanging coming from the maxillary sinus. These are all, as we know, red flags, right? So this was a cancer in the sinus, and uh, I think it was squamous cell carcinoma. But the other side, if you look, that really looks like a spaced occupying lesion. Look at the middle turbinate that's gone. Look at the ethmoids that are gone. Look at the floor of the orbit that's being pushed up. So that's definitely something that needs further evaluation, workup, medical CT, contrast, MRI, and uh, basically more advanced follow-up. So always whenever is something in the sinus that is a little bit sophisticated, send it to be further evaluated. Radiology report first, and then a radiologist will say, is further evaluation needed, or no, she or he knows what's going on, give you the report, matter is set up. So, also we have some variations of normal anatomy here that we're gonna go through, these are easy ones. So sometimes we have uh, basically um, areas of uh, branches of posterior superior alveolar artery. As you can see, it's coming in a horizontal way, and in this one, we don't see it. In this one, it's within the bone, in the in inner side, this one is within the border of the maxillary sinus, lateral wall of the sinus, and this one is in the outer border of the sinus. So also its importance is what? When you want to do a lateral window sinus lift, you have to see it. If it's there, you have to make sure that you don't want to basically hit it with your um, basically instruments. The other branch is anterior superior, and this one, anterior superior alveolar artery, this is in the anterior area. And this is just an example of that, that you can see in anterior superior, uh, basically, artery. So what are the variation, other variations of normal anatomy? Is presence of septa within the maxillary sinus. Um, yeah, okay. um, presence of uh, septa within the maxillary sinus. The significance is that if you want to do, again, lateral window or something, you want to like um, do a sinus lift, you want to make sure that uh, you are not uh, basically going in that area because that increases the chance of kind of rupturing the uh, Schneiderian membrane. So that's kind of how you modify your technique so that this is not in the way of when you're lifting your... Uh, basically a membrane. So let's talk a little bit about mandibles. So just like maxilla, as we lose our teeth, we can have different types of remodeling, different types and shapes of uh, edentulous ridge. And uh, we want to talk about a little bit about cross-sectional. So as you look at this panoramic in the anterior area, we all can see that it looks like we have a lot of, at least we have a very large height of bone. So it looks like our height is fine. So we took a cross-sectional imaging, and this is what we see. So we have a lot of height, but the problem is that this much of the height is useless because it's so thin. So that gives us that kind of idea of how thin that is. So that's not useful. And in our next example, we see that we almost have like a good amount of like from here to here, like the length of bone or the height of bone is fine, but it's basal bone. Alveolar bone is only this much. So cross-sectional imaging really tells you where is the mandibular canal, so you see how much alveolar bone you have and how much basal bone you have, which is for implants really uh, sometimes not that uh, useful to have. This is also something that I'm sure when you do your cone beams, you do, and then you mark the nerve, and uh, you really want to see how much bone you have. So what you see here is that sometimes our bones can have uh, variations of normal anatomy. So you see that here we have a large undercut, and 
it's been reported almost, I think, 12 people that have been died by having their same procedure done. So as you see here, there's a huge area of undercut, and this is the myelohyoid ridge. Right? So below it, which is here, is submandibular gland depression and submandibular gland and submandibular space. So if we perforate the space, we will have hematoma and we will have a huge amount of edema. So there's been reports that patients will be uh, basically admitted to the hospital, they needed intubation and uh, uh, they needed to basically uh, get intubated. So that's something that we don't want to go there. And also we can have differences in al inferior alveolar nerve position and uh, basically variations. So sometimes we have the, here we have the mental foramen, and sometimes we have an extension, anterior extension, superior extension, and so on. So as you can see here, this is our mental foramen, then we have the incisive portion of the mandibular canal, and then it also goes all the way up. So you always have to look at, all the, look, at, look at these extensions. Do they have anterior, or where is the mental foramen? It can be any of these places. Sometimes we can also have bifid mandibular canals, or trifid. So as you can see here, there are multiple, uh, basically, branches of mandibular canals. So sometimes some people have more than one mandibular canal, and you can see it in cross-sectional imaging. Also, um, the other, uh, basically, variation that you can see is a canal that you can see very nicely, and it's called retromolar canal. So it's at the end, basically, retro, at the, like, the most posterior aspect of your last molar, and it has nerve and has artery. So if you don't know it's there, it's going to make uh, cause problems because it has both sensory and uh, basically um, bleeding uh, complications. So let's move on to our safe zones. Many people before used to think that there are some safe zones in the area of anterior mandible, but the reality has uh, basically um, proved that there are no safe zones to be exact. So we have a lot of areas of uh, nerves and uh, here in the area of lingual artery, sorry, we have lingual foramen, and lingual foramen can come out from different places. So they were seeing unexpected bleedings, unexpected hematomas, and that's the reason. Another reason is that in the area of anterior, base, uh, anterior mandible, we have a lot of anastomosis of different um, arteries. We have the submental artery, submandibular artery, and sublingual artery. So as you can see, they can even be life-threatening if you want to put an implant and you cut any of these. So you have to really be careful when you're evaluating your combin CT from your anterior area. This was the article I was talking about. So they had to be intubated, and they just had severe hematoma, and uh, things got really, really um, not nice. So that's something that we want to also uh, be uh, vigilant of. So one of the th other things that we can do with our cross-sectional cone beam images is that to evaluate the bone quality. If you have this cross-section in your practice, you'll be like, okay, do I have enough bone trabecul trabecular bone? Look at it. We have buccal and lingual bone, but the trabeculation is so faint. There's no, it's just all black. So that tells me that the amount of bone the patient has is also sparse or also processed or it doesn't exist. And that helps you communicate with your patient to be like, you know, we're going to go in, I don't think you have enough bone. So we have to basically graft it somehow with whatever graft material that you decide with them. Sure enough, they opened it and there was no bone. So uh, then they did the basically grafting procedures and then look at the amount of radio opacity there. So huge, significant improvement, and then they were able to put the implant. So also you can predict the um, stability and possibility of putting your uh, implants. So I put this in quick guided surgery workflow here for you. We have a lot of good speakers that are going to talk about these uh, for you in the today and next day. So basically everything starts with clinical evaluation, medical history. After you pass from that, we have the CBCT acquisition. We have planning software. After planning software, we have somehow, or you do intraoral scanning, or you have a replica of the, basically, of your teeth, and then you merge them in your software. You do your digital planning of implants, and you order your surgical guides. 
for CBCT, uh, basically ha that's how you will look at it. You will, have a, you will have your axial view, and then you will do the panoramic curve. The software will give you a panoramic reconstruction. You will mark the nerves, and then you will press the number and orientation and uh, basically the height and width and everything that you want when you're happy. Um, that's how you basically put it in your um, cross-sectional imaging, and then you will send it to, or to be printed or to get a surgical guide or whatever you do with it. But that's the, basically the air thing that cone beam can help us. So we talked about all of these things that we can see in our cone beams, but what are the limitations of cone beam? Some of the limitations are cone beams artifacts. So the one that you guys that work with cone beam know and don't like so much is the beam hardening. So whenever we have a dense area, such as implant, or um, this, it's going to attenuate or basically absorb a lot of, uh, of x-rays, so nothing will get to the sensor. So that's why it's going to look black, areas that are just adjacent to metallic, guta perca, and then uh, crowns or whatnot. So, so then you will have our old friend, that's PA. <laughs> so then you can use that for that. So as you know, PA has the highest resolution of all of our imaging modalities. With CT, it's interesting. With CT, we can see more things, but the resolution in PA is highest. So for example, resolution of uh, intraoral, like XDR, I mean, XDR just came to my mind, sensor is like 20 line pairs per millimeters, which is excellent. Resolution of cone beam is like six to seven line pairs per millimeters. So it's very low. But in cone beam, we see more things, but with a lower resolution. So always remember that the dose are there. And then we can have motion artifact, which is an artifact that's related to the patient. Patient is moving. We have motion artifact, reduces our diagnostic ability and diagnostic value of our scans. And uh, we can sometimes, I don't know if you've seen in your scans that we have rings. This is called the ring artifact, and that means that your machine needs calibration. So whenever this happens, call your technician and support system from your machine. And of course, because uh, of the way that cone beam is acquired, that in one, one rotation you get all the information that you need, we have a lot of uh, image noise and poor soft tissue resolution, meaning that we don't see the soft tissue. You know, like in medical CT, if it was medical CD, we would see the soft tissue, the brain, the gray area, everything, but we don't. In this one, we just see something as a plain um, thing. So cone beam is good to see osseous structures only, not uh, soft tissues, unless soft tissue is like kind of hanging or something that you can see it. So. The last slide we want to talk about is selection criteria. So now that we have cone beam, we have 2D, we have pano, we have PAs, are we supposed to always use cone beam or for everything cone beam or nothing cone beam or what, what's the verdict? So my, uh, my philosophy, uh, which also aligns with the um, Academy of Radiology philosophy, meaning uh, as low as reasonably achievable. So if I can get the information from uh, a PA, why should I take a cone beam? You have to have your own judgment. That's what's written in all recommendations. Or in simple terms, if you want to kill an ant, what do you use? A tank? AK-47? Or terror? Depends on where, which area of the world you live in, of course. So um, basically, that was our uh, message for today. So always use selection criteria. See what task are you do, doing and what imaging modality is appropriate for it. So basically, with that, we kind of conclude our lecture for today. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you.